Hi folks! Did you know that musicology has a dark side? Away from the usual pathways, a more technical and intricate side, more devious than any you thought possible. That's right, music analysis. When considering the various strands of what it means to study music at a higher level, some of the names are more familiar than others. Performance, composition, music history. We feel like we know these. Ethnomusicology, okay, a little more to unpack, but still straightforward enough to understand. Music theory and analysis, though, that's new. Well, probably not the theory bit. This video is for anyone trying to get their head around what music analysis actually is. Why we do it, what it can look like, why it's worth studying. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the problems that music analysis as a field faces at the moment and hint at some of the ways of addressing them in your own work. For now, sit back and let's get analytical. Look in my eyes, what do you see? A cult of music start by defining terms. Theory and analysis, lots of texts and universities use the two words interchangeably, but there is an important difference. Theory is the stuff we begin to learn when we first study music notation. Officially, this extends to the modelling of musical systems, or taxonomy of praxis. I would define music theory simply as the rules, in scare quotes, that underpin both music notation and also the pieces that make up a particular style. So, the music theory of jazz will be very different to the theory of hip-hop, for instance, though they do share elements too. Analysis goes further than that. Analysis applies concepts from music theory to help understand and interpret music. That could be a score, or a performance, or a recording. Analysis has its own theories about how to go about analysing a piece, but they all relate to different views on the essential music theory that constitutes the rules, for want of a better word. It's called music theory, not music facts. Can I just say the background piece at the moment, Wuthering Heights by Kate Bush, is a piece screaming out for analysis. The verse has shifts moving around the eastern hexatonic cycle, and the chorus modulates to an enharmonic parallel major of the mediums, and that's before we get to instrumentation and production. So theory is the rules, if you will, and analysis is the actual act of comparing those rules to a piece, and then reaching our own interpretation that communicates our own individual thinking about a piece. That act of interpretation can include any number of steps of thinking about the music, such as putting it into a completely different kind of representation. We could place the structure of a work into a table, for instance. I'm going to illustrate this a tiny bit with a very famous canonical piece by J.S. Bach, the first prelude to the well-tempered clavier. Okay, a first few steps to analysis, if you will. On a simple level, we can see that each bar repeats the same half, so twice, at the minim level, at the uh, half note level. If I wanted to sort of summarise the content of the chords, I could take out half the notes. Even simpler, I could simplify all the rhythm as much as possible. This piece works by taking a chord and playing it in this very particular rhythmic pattern, ascending up the keyboard. If I simply just to show it with its simplest note values, i.e. a semi-breve, whole note, we end up with a chord per bar. The music theory level of knowledge tells us that classical harmony obeys rules of tonality, that the tonic is the most important chord, and that all motion away from it wants to return to it. Even in the first four bars, we see this on a very simple level. If I label the chords, they go one, two, an inverted seventh chord, 5 in inversion, and 1 again. In fact, bar 4 is identical to bar 1. In a very simple way, the first four bars obey this theory. If I carry on this rhythmic reduction, I get something that looks like this for the whole piece. That's a simple enough process. It's perhaps the beginning of an analysis. 
What's crucial about analysis is that we get to an interpretive level of understanding. This sort of simple description is a good illustration of theory, but I haven't started to say anything really in depth about the piece. Description of what happens in a piece isn't really analysis, not yet. I'm going to leave this example here, but now look at a bit of writing on what analysis is. I've pulled together three different articles that were written to defend music analysis at different times. The first is by notorious German philosopher Theodor Adorno. He wrote about analysis and its relation to music performance. A piece by Handel, broadly speaking, may to some extent be grasped without analysis. Beethoven's Diabelli variations, on the other hand, are already much less likely to be understood without it, whereas the bagatelles of Webern cannot be grasped at all in this way. If Webern's bagatelles are performed unanalyzed, though with faithful attention to all markings in the score, but without uncovering the subcutaneous relationships, a merely respectable rendering of the score as it stands, that is, then the result, as is not difficult to imagine, is utter nonsense. On the other hand, the moment these pieces are analysed and performed after having been analysed, they make sense and the light dawns. So for Adorno, any performer worth their salt is carrying out an analysis of a piece before they play. We talk about a performance being all about the interpretation, after all. I love Adorno's article for another reason, though. He does a great job of anticipating many people's arguments against even beginning analysis. And you know, I kind of get it. Theory and analysis are slow, methodical subjects, and you might feel that they distract you and take time away from when you'd rather be composing or performing. Well, here's a countdown of my top three complaints against analysis and why I think they're wrong. Three. I don't like that analysis claims to be objective or scientific. This is maybe a symptom of traditional analysis teaching. The point of analysis is interpretation and communication. We might give lots of evidence to help communicate our interpretation to other people, but it's still subjective. Multiple interpretations are okay. And anybody telling you that it's purely scientific or purely objective is missing the point. Two. I just write what sounds good to me. I don't need to analyse it or know theory. I've got news for you. In discerning what sounds good to you, you are doing analysis whether you like it or not. It won't hurt to understand why you like the things that you like. Number one, the all-time top one. Was the composer thinking about that when they wrote it though? Oh boy, this one. I'll leave it to Adorno. This question is completely irrelevant. It is very often precisely the deepest interrelationships that analyses are able to uncover within the compositional process, which have been unconsciously produced. One has to differentiate here between the object itself and the way in which it may have arisen in the consciousness or unconsciousness of the artist. We take it for granted that we usually separate the piece of music and the literal psychological process that went through the mind of the composer when they were writing it, to pretend that we could possibly know that is, well, weird. My next key article, from Kofi Agawu, writing in 2004, has this to say on exactly that question. The analyst must not be distracted by questions of intentionality, as when sceptics wonder whether the composer was conscious of relationships unearthed by the analyst. Analysis is not mere description, nor is it bound by a consideration of wholes or of totality. Each analysis must produce a result unique to the work. Okay, I'm going to do a tiny bit of analysis to try and show this in more detail. Here is a prelude by Clara Schumann. At first glance, it's very simple. Here's the kind of music theory annotation to the score with chords and harmony. Okay, so far so good. Now here's where I extend this to my interpretation of how this tiny prelude works, or as Adorno would say, the essential truth content of this work. I think that the first five chords set up all of the material for the rest of the prelude. What follows is then a way of expanding and adapting these opening ideas, almost like sort of fixing a problem by looking at it another way. 
How can I argue that? Well, I think that the first few chords are embedded in the second half, like I've emphasised them here. More than that, the melody notes that I've emphasised here are also parallel to those opening chords. So I think we actually have three different ways of looking at the same problem. So I started doing this by looking first at the, the notes, playing it through, looking at the score, and figuring out what's going on. I didn't have a presupposed guess at what would be happening. I started with the score, with the music itself, for want of a better term, and then started to analyse. I'm going to leave it there for the Schumann analysis. There's a lot more we could add, and that's the beginnings of an analysis. But you see how I'm interpreting how I think it works, how I understand the piece, and I'm backing that up with bits of theoretical evidence. You see how I moved from the theoretical labelling of the piece into something a little bit more descriptive, trying to look deeper into it. That helps our understanding, and anyone else can look at it and find something else too. As analysts, we are not looking for the answers, we are looking to communicate our own understanding, perhaps to help others. Okay, in a nutshell, that's my defence of analysis. We need it to consider music as a broad thing that we do, and to actually think about the system of logic that often sits behind the music that we enjoy. There are still problems of analysis that I can't address here, but I will mention them and I'll hopefully return to them on this channel. Perhaps the biggest academic criticism of analysis is that it needs to move with the times. Some of the theories we use uh, to do analysis are embedded in very old ideas which arguably reflect the thinking of their times. This means traditional analysis often has little room to consider questions of gender or race, or even the crisis affecting classical music, decolonization. Our music theory and analysis is dominated by white European males just as much as the classical canon. And slowly, bit by bit, classical musicians are addressing that in the canon, but we need more voices to do this in analysis. But like I said, that's a topic for another video. I'll leave you with one final call for analysis, this time from Julian Horton, writing in 2020. Above all, analysis is necessary, because the comprehension of music as art requires it. It is only via analysis that we can access the surplus that is the domain of technical autonomy, and it is only by accessing technical autonomy that we can hope to define music's artifice rather than its utility or fungibility. Historical research can readily establish what made music useful or fungible in the past, but without analysis it can only see how the past spoke about music as art. It cannot see what is artistic in music. In other words, analysis is vital, because at some point we always need to talk about some concept of the music itself, whether that's the chord progression in a rock song, or the adapted classical structures in the Shostakovich symphony, or the interplay of pitches in an Indian raga. We need analysis now more than ever, to help us articulate our feelings about music in a meaningful way. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, please like and subscribe and share these videos. Please let me know if you've got any ideas for things that you'd like to see covered on the channel. Okay, thanks very much. See you in the next video. Some music on.